We have 6 p.m. Good evening, everyone. My name's Isa, and I am a bookseller at Politics and Prose, and I'd like to welcome everyone here as you're coming in to PNP Live. Thanks for joining us here in this virtual format in the midst of these extraordinary times, throughout all of which we strive to continue to bring you, <laughs> the authors you love, and their work to our Politics and Prose community. If at any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase the author's book, The Mysteries, on the Politics and Prose website, along with her other works, as well as work by Lauren Groff, who is also with us tonight. Additionally, you can ask the guests a question by clicking on the Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. And while we will try to get to everyone's questions, we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. Finally, we want to thank you for being here with us today. We are so thankful for our family of loyal customers and new friends for keeping our business and our spirits afloat. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's guests. Along with her latest release, Marissa Silver is the author of Little Nothing, a New York Times editor's choice, Mary Coyne, a New York Times bestseller, and winner of the Southern California Independent Booksellers Award and an NPR and BBC Best Book of the Year. Alone With You, The God of War, which was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize for Fiction, No Direction Home, and Babe in Paradise, a New York Times Notable Book of the Year and Los Angeles Times Book of the Year. Her short fiction has also won the O. Henry Prize and has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and many other publications, and has been included in the Best American Short Stories, the O. Henry Prize Stories, as well as other anthologies. In 2018, Silver was awarded the Mary Ellen von der Hayden Fellowship at the Dorothy Lewis and B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. And along with us tonight, we also have Lauren Groff, author of the novels The Monsters of Templeton, which was shortlisted for the Orange Prize for New Writers, Delicate Edible Birds, a collection of stories, and Arcadia, a New York Times notable book, winner of the Medici Book Club Prize, and finalist for the LA Times Book Award. Her third novel, Fates and Furies, was a finalist for the National Book Award in Fiction, and the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Kirkus Award. It won the 2015 American Booksellers Association Indies Choice Award for Fiction and was a New York Times notable book and bestseller. Her fourth novel, Matrix, will be published in September 2021. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Tin House, The Best American Short Stories, and many other anthologies as well. So I'm so honored to be introducing to you tonight these amazing authors, Marissa Silver and Lauren Groff. Please join me in welcoming them to Politics and Prose Live. Take it away, ladies. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Marissa. I'm Hi, so Lauren. excited to be here talking <laughs> with you right now. You're in Vancouver, yes. I'm in Vancouver. At the moment, which yes. must be very strange for you. Um, yeah, it's, you know, as I was saying earlier, it's, um, you know, I'm here, uh, my husband's working here. And so I'm kind of out of place and out of, it, I'm virtual squared. That's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> We're always virtual squared. <laughs> so so uh, thank you for everyone for coming tonight. I would like to say just a special thank you to Politics and Prose for hosting us. We love our independent bookstores. We love them so much. Um, please do buy Marissa's beautiful book, The Mysteries. Um, <laughs> at, I'm sure there's going to be a, a link in the chat. Um, also, over the course of the tonight, I cannot uh, beg you harder <laughs> to please put your questions into the Q&A so that uh, I, I can ask Marissa your brilliant questions. Um, so The Mysteries uh, is your seventh book. Is this yes. correct? Mm -hmm. Seventh book. Um, and it's this phenomenal character study, truly, of a, of a person who um, I'm going to let you introduce through the words uh, of the reading that you've prepared, if that's all right. Sure. Okay. Um, you are referring to the central character who is a seven-year-old girl named Miggy Brenneman. So this is how the book begins. They are running. There is no reason to go slow. They run out of Miggy's bedroom, down the stairs, through the living room, skipping over the albums that lie scattered across the floor. Miggy nimbly avoids Brubeck, Evans, and Monk, but she wants to crush them too to hear the satisfying snap of the records under her keds, to feel the momentary pulse of destruction. No, her mind says, why not? Because no, her mother would say sharply, Jean's reactions are one part anger, 
In two parts fear, the fault between those feelings align Miggy's senses in the quaver of misgiving that passes across her mother's face when she wants to reprimand her daughter. It's a line Miggy can't resist treading, the same way she must trouble a loose tooth, the sharp pain and the dull tickle, equally irresistible. Who are you? Her mother asked after Miggy shattered the back window of the station wagon with a rock or drew a butterfly on the living room rug because a rock so dense in the hand must be flung and a magic marker its tip as wet as a dog's nose must draw. I am Miggy, she said, but of course her mother knew that. The words mother and father don't exist without the words Miggy. She is the reason for them. I am Miggy, she declares now as she dances around the albums, imagining them as lily pads, imagining herself as a fairy so light she could land on the water between the pads and not drown. Or maybe the albums are the water and the space between are leaves the size of elephant feet because everything is always itself and the inside out of itself. A shirt, a lie, a vomit, dream. I am Ellen, Ellen says more quietly, because this is not her house. These are not her father's records. Those are not her parents' empty tumblers sitting on the coffee table where water rings and cigarette burn marks are branded into the wood. But uh, will you just stop for one minute, Jean always says. But even when Miggy tries as hard as she can to stand still, something inside her sparks like the telephone wire that whipped across the street during last winter's ice storm, spitting electricity into the frigid air. She bursts with a desire to move, to speak, to sing, because there is so much. There is so much all the time that even if she could spread her arms wider than the universe, she still could not hold it all. There are the mosquito bites that she is not supposed to scratch. There are starbursts of blood on her arms and shins because she can't help it. There is knowing what she is supposed to do and not doing it, and knowing how she is supposed to behave and misbehaving. It makes her skin prickle. It makes her choose a grape popsicle, but then wish she'd eaten red so that her lips would be painted in defiance of her mother, who says that makeup is not for children. Her rage at the injustice overcomes her. She is mad at the popsicles and mad at her mother, who always says, choose one. But how and why? It's so good. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for reading that. So... I first heard you read this uh, when we were teaching together at Warren Wilson, and there's just so much propulsive uh, action in the prose itself that that matches this wild, semi-destructive, very sweet, but um, a little bit uncontrolled little girl, right? I mean, she, she really cannot control her impulses. She's very impulsive and very um, electric as a character. Yeah. So tell me, Marissa, where did this figure of Miggy come from? Was she, who, is she somebody? She's not me. I was way more, <laughs> way more dutiful and retiring. Um, as you said, Miggy is this sort of unruly wild kid um, who, sort of holds her fist up to the universe and is trying very hard to figure out how to um, exceed all the limits that are drawn around her. Um, you know, I, I don't really have good answers for almost any of these kinds of questions because they just kind of come and, you know, there she was. I mean, I had, I knew that I wanted to write a story about, you know, these two families and the particular event that happens um, that changes them um, in relationship to one another. And and Miggy just appeared and she appeared sort of fully formed in my mind. I mean, that rarely happens. Usually I, it, it takes me a whole novel to know someone. Um, but Miggy was just there, her kind of, you know, sweetness and her rage. And I, I guess what I also wanted to do was not only embody a child, but embody a child as a fully complex, human. You know, I think often when we think of children, we think that they are innocent or we think that they are, you know, we try to box them. I mean, we mostly we try to box up humans anyway, but um, I just felt like kid, children, even if they can't express the nuance of what they feel, I wanted to be able to express the nuance of what she felt. I wanted to be inside her skin and be able to sort of articulate what she can't yet. And so um, that's where I started. And, and, you know, even when the, I ran into the inevitable, you know, challenges and the walls that you always do when you're writing, she just kept, she was always there. And I kept thinking, I can't let her go. And I have to figure this out because I, I need to write her. Yeah, I love that. Um, 
what you're saying uh so it corresponds to the epigraph that you have in the beginning right of marianne baruch um line from a poem which i couldn't find actually it was never childhood to a child right so talk to me about about the perspective of children in in terms of this overarching idea of what childhood is um in this book well you know, it's hard. It, I mean, I guess what, what I'll talk about is sort of how to, how I approach the writing of a child, because it's it's um you know you can approach it from the outside looking in, um you can approach it from the inside and but but if you're so close to a character, you're very hamstrung by as I was saying their inability to fully articulate or interestingly articulate their experience. I mean, you kind of you know a seven year old is not going to have a kind of wealth of language at her disposal to try to to discuss what she's feeling inside. Um, or what she thinks about her world. So trying to write her was sort of a, a, a an exercise in both being able to sort of be inside her skin. And part of that was the, what you talked about initially, that kind of propulsive, very physical way of writing her, um, but also being able to sort of hover a little bit above her um, at times so that I could um, come at her from a slightly, not a huge far away distance, but a slightly more uh, remote perspective so that I could give language that to her experience, give some con context to her experience. Um, but really the, the, the job for me in this book for all the characters, not just Miggy, but you know, the other major characters are her parents and her best friend, Ellen and, and Ellen's parents was to sort of inhabit them so deeply and so precisely that um, that they that they you know pulsed on the page, and that was really I mean the, the book has a central kind of dramatic event around which it turns, but other than that, it's not a very plot heavy book. I mean, as you said in the beginning, a character study, and in some ways it is a it is a six person character study, mm -hmm. um, all of them involved in the same kind of world and activities, but. That was the challenge of the book was to just get so far down inside these people that they really were fully dimensionalized on the page. But I feel like that's the challenge of all your books, right? I mean, that's the, the challenge that you set yourself for all. You're, you're very character. For me, yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, okay, some books more than others have a little bit more of a plot engine. Like, you know, yeah. usually it has to do with like movement. Like she goes here and then she goes there. That's about as much <laughs> plot as I've ever been able to kind of conjure. It's just not something that comes to me. I don't have this, you know, kind of, that's not my sense of drama. My sense of drama is maybe writ much smaller and more internally. And so, um, so yeah, my books, even though they all, um, you know, they're, they're, they have a variety of different subject matters and, and contexts and histor historical contexts, they really are the study of um, people making not even giant leaps, but small leaps. You know, what, what excites me when I read something is when I sense a, a person hasn't made a 180 degree, you know, turn in, in terms of how they see the world, but they've kind of shifted a little bit to the right. And then suddenly their view just got 360 degrees wider. So that's that's what I get excited about. Yes. Yeah. No, it, that's it. Is, it's it's incredibly exciting, right? Um, I do because you keep coming back to it. I'm not going to um, do spoilers. I'm trying very, very hard not to. <laughs> uh, there is this enormous event in the middle of the book, and it's funny they say they're you know like it's mostly character. It is mostly character driven, but this is a big plot point, right? right? This is the axis around which the book is built. Um, I noticed structurally. You created the novel as a chiasmus, the shape of an X. It's a sort of the, the Greek X is a um, chi. Um, and it's a very old structural shape for for particularly um, um, holy texts, right? A lot of uh, biblical texts are made in a chiastic shape. So, um, you know, it's on in chapter 23 out of 46 right. that the the really incredible change happens. Talk to me about your like, was this always something that you knew that you're going to do with this book? Um, you know, I, I knew that this event happened and I'm sorry for we're so coy about this, but to give it away would would not be a good thing. Um, I knew that that was the central part of the book, although for a long time it happened in the first chapter and it was a it was something that i um i 
I dispensed with early on. And then it was a long, you know, the next 250 pages was this sort of um, ripple effect of that. And what I felt was that um, it wasn't powerful if I didn't know the people yet. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that what, um, and as, in a funny way, it was like less painful to not know them mm. when this thing happens. And then because you're not as invested, right? As a reader, you're not as invested and then this uh, dramatic thing happens and you're interested and you maybe hopefully wanna know what happens, but your heart isn't tugged in the same way. And for me, I felt like as that I needed to, I needed to let people know who these people were in order that the power of what happened and the consequence of what happened um, was was well powerful enough. You know what, what that's what the book is about. So um, so I moved I moved it and finally it, it took place in the center of the X. And as you said that, I realized, gosh, I've used that structure quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's um, so there is a sort of before and after structure to this novel. Um, and, and that's very much what it is about. It's about what happens as a result of an event and how does it shape and change all the people's lives, none more so than this seven-year-old girl who has probably the least wherewithal with which to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And it's really, you know, um, it's really an awakening. I think, I think our colleague, Antonia Nelson, this brilliant writer who we work with at Warren Wilson um, said, something I'm paraphrasing her, but said that every book is a coming of age novel or, you know, and in a way, no matter who you're writing about, it's a coming of age novel, right? There's a, there's a, a, a movement and a change and a shift and a new awareness for not only Miggy at age seven, but for her parents at age 30, for all the characters in the novel, it's a kind of, um, it's an awakening. I'm writing this down because I don't know if I believe that is true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you yeah. can debate it. I, have, I actually have to think about this. <laughs> write an essay about. <laughs> um, trying to think of. Yes, that's the, it's it's funny. So uh, because of um, this character, and maybe because you know, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. It's been a long day. I get up at five. Uh, Ramona Quimby, her her um, author. Oh, Beverly Cleary. Yeah, she she passed away. Um, I saw a literary antecedent in Miggy. Are there are there other ones or are there other books that you were thinking about in either in opposition to um, you were sort of pushing against them or you were, you were sort of inspired them by them when you were writing this book, Marissa? That's a great question. And I did do a little shout out to Ramona in the book. Oh, yeah. At the end of the book, Miggy, Miggy picks up her first, one of her first books that she settles into is a Ramona book. Um, because of course she would love Ramona. Um, you know, it's funny when I, when I, someone was asking me a similar question before, and I realized I don't really read books to look for the book that I'm writing. I read books to look for craft and to figure out how to shape the book that I'm writing. So I think in some ways, when I decided to write a book about a child, I shied away from books about children because mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily, that wasn't, I don't, I didn't need to read about my subject. What I needed to read was about um, the, for instance, the way in which different authors have ha maybe treated childhood um, or different structures or how do I deal with flashback or all the questions that you come up with, come up upon as a writer. So I think that the books that I read as I'm writing tend to be less subject. They're, they're less consonant in terms of subject than in terms of the kind of craft challenges that I'm coming up upon. But I did, you know, I did spend a lot of time with what Maisie knew, um, the Henry James book. And, and in, interestingly, you know, Maisie in that book, I mean, that's a really a narrated book. I mean, you know, it's a it's a big omniscient narrator mm -hmm. um, and we're inside her, but not to the degree I think that I got inside of, of Mickey. Um, but I love what I loved and I stole, stole is not the right word, but took from him was this kind of very fluid um, narrative so that he could, he, you know, he rises up, he goes inside, he goes closer, he goes further away. And that's how I conceived of sort of the narrative distance that there were going to be times when I was deep inside her, you know, I was so much more, right. And then there were times when I was going to pull away and see her. So I think the books that, that 
kind of inspired me had more to do with craft than to do with, you know, kids in particular. Right. But you did say you looked at some about how to treat childhood, right? Well, you know, when, when I, I wrote the majority of this book, when I was doing this fellowship at the New York Public Library, um, and I had at my disposal, the New York Public Library, which is the point of the fellowship. You have all these books. And what I did was I spent a lot of time, not, not necessarily reading as novels about childhood, but reading about how childhood is, is, um, is created in novels over history, mm. how the Victorians dealt with children, how the, you know, how the Gothic is and child is, is formulated, how the, and, and that was really um, a great way of trying to narrow down how I would formulate my kids in the book, um, thinking about the different ways in which over history, the child has been formulated. A lot of it has to do with how the child is conceived. Is a child conceived as this innocent you know, Edenic th child who's, you know, is a child considered something almost evil, you know, the, in the Gothic in that, you know, um, it, over time, the perception of the child and how the child existed in society changed, right? So the literature about oh, children. I'm so excited. I, I can't give so you an exit, Jesus. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that, you know, I think, as I said in the beginning, you know, in the Victorian era, the child was the innocent, right? And, 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 and it wasn't, and I think it wasn't until Henry James wrote what Maisie knew, and I'm probably generalizing that really the child was given a kind of complicated interiority mm. and, and, a, and something that we would think of as being a modern interiority. And so, um, so there's every gradation in between, but I think that that study more than just reading books of where children were the central character was more useful to me to think about, well, how am I approaching my kid? Um, you know, what, what, how do I see her? Yeah. One of the really beautiful um, elements of this book that is relatively rare, I think, is um, the way that you portray a profoundly close friendship. Uh, mm -hmm. among children of that age. And it's almost as though um, it's a cleaving, um, a, a, just a, a, almost like like a spiritual cleaving in a certain way. Um, Mickey has this best friend named Ellen, who's um, who's very much the opposite of Mickey, I would say, All right? She's shy, she's very precise, she's very careful. Um, she's a little bit prim, would you agree with this? A little mm -hmm. bit prim. Do you think that such, um, this friendship, um, this closeness arose out of characters being so unlike each other. I mean, if Miggy met another uh, child like her, would she have- That would never happen. <laughs> no, that, that would be like combustion. Um, <laughs> I, I have this really profound memory as a child and I certainly saw it, not so much in my children's friendships because they're boys and I think boy friendships are a little bit, I mean, to be and make another mass generalization, but, um, what what I think is that there are certain pe certain kids who are sort of incredibly charismatic and almost dangerously charismatic, and that they draw kids a, we a we weaker kind of kid to them, mm -hmm. and um, and there's love there, but there's also power. And I think friendships. I mean, what's interesting to me about friendships is the power element of them. I mean, there is love, there's intimacy, there's all those things. But I think what's curious about friendships to write about in, with children or with adults is the element of power for me. That's what's interesting. And so I think that because Miggy is this kind of incandescent, you know, sparky, uh, and, and, and because she treads this line that's dangerous, you know, she's always, she's about to always do something bad. And sometimes she does. I think that it's very powerful for a girl who's not as, doesn't have the wherewithal to sort of actualize some of those more id-like um, feelings in herself. So I think that's the dynamic of that friendship. I'm not sure if some Miggy and Miggy plus Miggy could ever happen. I, I mean, yeah, I, I think that would be a really challenging friendship. I mean, I, I think that that would be the friendship that as a mother, you walk in there and you say, you know, let's take a break from each other. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's um, you know, friendships are, it, they're interesting to write about because it's, um, you know, we take them as a given um, and, and we take them as being supportive and um, generally useful to each member, but they're also filled with um, drama and um, manipulation and even at age seven. 
probably maybe even more so at age seven. Probably, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. A lot of the adults um, scrim or veneer of civility has not yet set into a seven year old. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing about, you know, friendships is especially with in young children, I think, is that they're sort of like practicing all their emotions on each other, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're practicing love. They're practicing, I mean, you know, you, you practice protosexual stuff with you know, in your friendships with children. And, and, and it's, so it's a very, you know, complicated, slightly erotic, slightly dominant, domineering, you know, it, it's, it's a really potent world to get into. Yeah. And as an adult looking at extant friendships between children now, it's, it's often very uncomfortable to watch yeah. <laughs> like as an adult to see those dynamics uh, sort of surfacing that I don't think the kids are aware of, but you know, to be like, oh. <laughs> yeah. And you see your kid behaving in a way that you don't like, Yeah, yes. but yeah. you're not in the friendship. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so there's also, well, um, this is very much a St. Louis book, right? There's a very profound um, sense that this had to be written in St. Louis in this particular time. So tell me about that. Like what went into the creation of the, the St. Louis of the time? St. Louis of it all. Let's see, well, what's the St. Louis <laughs> aspect? Um, you know, like, like, you know, the sort of appearance of Miggy, I just had this gut feeling when I started the book that it was neither a California book, which is where I live, nor a New York book, which is where I was raised, but it was a Midwestern story, which is where I was born and where I lived until I was seven. And I grew up in Ohio, um, but I've spent more, much more time of my life in St. Louis because um, not only is my husband from there and his whole family, but for some reason, every one of my college roommates was from St. Louis. And so I spent an enormous amount of time in St. Louis. And although I'm not, you know, a, a native, it's a city that is, it's history, it's, it's, um, it's look, it's, it, uh, it fascinates me. And, and I've done a lot, you know, I, I did a lot of, you know, reading about it and thinking about it. And I, and the, and the story is set in 1973, which is also important. I mean, cause it's not just any moment in St. Louis history. It's in 1973, which not only for St. Louis, for the country was to my mind, a kind of almost like a little nadir in time. You know, it was after the, the war was just winding down. Watergate was happening. Um, the, the, there was a lot of malaise there, there was a, um, a recession. So economically things were sort of tense and down. I think there was this feeling, you know, after the Vietnam war of just, you know, a kind of let, let down of everything, you know, all the anger and it just, it, it finally a kind of depression that this happened. Um, and I, and I kind of wanted to set the story at this moment where there was a, a kind of sense of languishing in the country. Um, I mean, there were other things that were fomenting. The women's movement was starting and that sort of figures into the characters in, in some way. But um, my memory of that time was, although I was young, was that it was, there was a dark, I remember a darkness, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and it just felt like that is the moment when this story happens because it's a moment when the adult characters are stressed. Mm -hmm. and where the stressor of what happens in the book at, is combined with the other stressors that are happening in their life and create this kind of you know landscape for change for them mm -hmm. so that's why I, I i i said it there and then and it was a um you know i like i a place is really important to me and it sort of um it's important to me because i think that we are who we are as much uh, because of where we are is what we're feeling inside. And I was just going to read a little bit to you about from a, a section about place. Um, this is about Julian, who is the father of Miggy, and he runs a hardware store. And he is driving some um, equipment in St. Louis. Julian drives past the shuttered factories, their blown out windows, portals to nowhere. The city has turned its back on whole neighborhoods. The unapologetic segregation was one attribute his father didn't crow about, but for no principled reasons. When they drove north of Del Mar, Maurice would roll up his window and Esther would warn Julian to lock his doors. As he nears the river, the smell of the brewery fills the cab of his truck. The cloyingly sweet odor of the yeast, the sour turn of the wart, for a time, his father's wholesale supplier did business down on the riverfront, 
The steamboats docking at levees filled Julian with excitement. All the suppliers have moved out to the highway by now, and the warehouses that are left, strung out along the landings, are long past their relevance. The Mississippi is still high from last spring's flood. Miggy worried about the river overrunning its banks. She talked about it incessantly, certain that the family would drown in their sleep. He and Jean weren't able to make her understand that their home, 10 miles inland, was not threatened, but she couldn't grasp 10 minutes, much less 10 miles. When it was safe, Julian took her down to the, river, to the river to allay her fear. Both of them stood in quiet awe of the storm's consequence, the light poles halfway submerged and the young trees so nearly drowned that only their tips poked up above the surface of the water, along with the cab of a red truck. And, it, you know, one of, one of the things that I care a lot about when I write is making sure that descriptions of place are utterly tied to emotion of the character. You know, I mean, I, I'm, and I guess this is true of all the research I ever do is I, I don't really want my book to be a compendium of, you know, research or a, a exposition about a place or, you know, it has to do, a place is only valid for me as it's felt by the characters that I'm writing about. So, you know, Julian has a hardware store that he's inherited from his father. It's struggling, there's a recession. It's probably gonna go out of business. So, he, and, and yet he grew up, he has a great love for this city and a great kind of almost like nostalgic, sorrowful love for it. And so as he drives through it, what he feels, I hope, gives us a sense of who he is. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, so I care, I care a lot about that. I care a lot about, I mean, I feel like who I am is very much defined by the places where I've lived and the land that I walk on and how I, re how I respond to it and the weather and the, all that stuff. Um, yeah, it's resonant, it's back and forth, right? I mean, yeah. you feel outward and then you, it, the landscape feels back inside. Yeah. Yeah. We don't exist, you know, we actually aren't virtual people. No, <laughs> I think right now, after 14 months of this, yeah, I think we're all like, like I haven't worn pants without elastics in a very long time. Um, yeah, um, not that that makes one a non virtual person, but um, okay. <laughs> so, this next question I really want to ask, but I have to tell you, I'm very ambivalent about it. Okay, I um, make a point of never asking any other writer about their lives and yet you have to ask me i i want to okay um, <laughs> <laughs> um but it's because uh this is also about your creative work so um so, uh, it's free game i think um but before you were a novelist you were a filmmaker can oh, i ask yes. a question you were a filmmaker and I see the way that your directorial eye um, comes into your work. Do you think that it does, or do, are they entirely separate? Um, um, no, not at all. I mean, I think that the things that I learned as a director in terms of craft, um, they're they're somewhat different in terms of you know the difference between cinema and and writing, but there's a lot of overlap. Um, you know, when you think about editing scenes, where are we looking? Where are we putting the the, the audience's eye? What are you know? And what what scene lays up next to another scene? How are we moving through time? All those th all those questions, which are very much the questions of fiction, are things that I initially learned as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, the other thing that I feel is might be true of my fiction is as much as this. I, I tend to be interested also in how people act mm -hmm. and how people behave. And as much as there's a lot of interiority in this book, um, I, I think from my experience as a filmmaker where you learn so much about a person by what they do, because we don't have access to their interiority in film. Mm -hmm. We have a, a, an actor's face and we have their eyes and we have some language, but I don't know that we can trust language to be telling us an interiority. Um, so I think that there's a way in which um, I want to marry the kind of consciousness with behave with active behavior as a way to try to triangulate who a person is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's definitely true. Do you think you also, and this is actually a, a question that I I can't wait to hear what you have to say because I don't know. I don't know what you're going to say. Um, do you think that you also um, 
tend to, and I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, examples, um, the opposite, you tend to choose sort of a more omniscient point of view, because you can sort of come in and out. Of... I, think, I think it's a, yes. And I think, I think like a camera a little bit in that like way. Camera. Like when I think about point of view, in my mind, I am thinking about what am I seeing? And, and, you know, how far away am I? How near am I? And when you're really close, then you're diving into the consciousness and then you're not a camera at all. But, um, but yeah, I do have a sense of like this kind of moving uh, camera that can direct the character's gaze, direct our gaze. Yeah, I think a little bit about that. And I think that what you talked about in the very beginning of this conversation, which had to do with sort of the energy of the, which is a little bit about Miggy, but I'd say that might be true of a lot of that. There's kind of like a, we're in, you know, a, 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 some books start very slowly and quietly. And that's probably not true of my work. There's probably a kind of um, a, 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 more, a more urgent, like kind of entry, entry that I don't know whether that has to do with film, but I sort of feel like it might have to do with film. Right. How I said right. that. Yeah. I have not made films for very, very, very many <laughs> years. So I, I really think at this point, my work is, you know, my, my sense of, of craft is purely, you know, kind of literary. Well, and we, so we just went through a very long time of um, isolation and solitude. And if you are used to being alone, it's great. Or if you're a novelist like us, it could also be like, mind-bendingly too much um what have you had over the course of the pandemic or is that are you, are you speaking <laughs> personally <laughs> have you had any desire to go back to a more collaborative collective art form no no you know when i when i stopped being a, a filmmaker which was you know 30 years ago right. um god that's a long time uh one of the things I felt strongly was that I, I didn't want to collaborate with anybody. You know, when, sometimes when you see those award shows and people get up and they say, oh, film is a collaborative art and I want to thank it. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly why I got out. <laughs> I like very much being alone in my room. I like being the decision maker. I mean, you know, <laughs> with film, there's a kind of, you know, if you want a dress to be red, sometimes you have to fight about that. And I don't want to fight about it. So I, I, uh, um, no, I feel really happy. I mean, it was a hard year, I think, to be, even though I'm used to sitting in my room being alone, mm -hmm. I think there was just so much reactivity in what was happening in the world politically in terms of the pandemic. So much was going on that, I don't know for you, you, you know, it was just hard to settle, you know, and to, to find the space that felt like, it almost felt like I was, am I allowed to settle? Like, I, or, or maybe I just felt like I couldn't, like there was just a, re so I felt like, you know, I'm beginning to, um, but yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a weird year. How did you do? No, not well. <laughs> 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 no, I um, yeah. Unfortunately, my whole family was around to witness me not doing well as a writer too, and so my yeah. kids are just like they basically every day they're like, "Have a good day watching Italian movies, mommy." <laughs> <laughs> I do other things too, not many, but yes, you're right. It's yeah, <laughs> but I, but yeah, it was a hard year to really um, feel as though one could settle and and actually write well. And I don't know if it's just anxiety, um, cortisol. Who who knows? I think it's cortisol, but I and I also think it was a year where you know a lot of people were questioning like, well, what what should we be writing about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the current events felt so powerfully urgent that it almost seemed silly to imagine you know some other invented you know which i don't think is true i don't i but i think that there was a way in which it was hard to carve out that that place where uh you know you need to be to sort of let your mind go away mm -hmm. even if you're writing about the world even if you're writing about something that you know is is happening in the now you have to create a lyric approach to it you're not writing an article you're writing a you know a book and and it requires letting your mind let loosen let go of the facts and the figures you know and i think that was pretty hard this year and the faith that um it will matter right yeah. i think that, that that was part of the, the problem but i think what matters are books that touch people and books 
a wide variety of books touch a wide variety of people. There's not only one kind of book that needs to be written. I think we need to have all, all kinds of books. We're a various bunch of people and That's people right. respond differently. So, yeah. Well, speaking of that, um, I also think in your career, you've written a wide variety of books, right? So how do you think the mysteries um, exist in sort of the tapestry of your overall work? How would you describe it? Well, you know, I think that I am a little bit restless in my imagination and in, in what I want to do. And so I'm not really interested, like once I've written a book that might partake of some kind of template or be, I don't want to write ever like that again. <laughs> and I mean, I want to write well, and I want to write stories that are, are consistently compelling. But, you know, I wrote a book called Mary Coyne, which was based on a photograph, a famous photograph by Dorothea Lange, and it was a historical book. And it was, you know, and I thought, well, I guess I could make a career of like, you know, writing books based on, you know, and I thought, no, I did that. That's done. You know, I mean, I, I nothing about that interests me anymore. So I think that I'm a little bit um, restless and I'm always looking for something that feels for me like something I've never done. I mean, it may have been done by many, many writers, but for me, something that that is feels like I'm going to discover s some new capability in my imagination. That's what excites me. You know, when I wrote uh, my last book, which was Little Nothing, which was a kind of fantasy fable. Um, you know, I, I, the most fun thing about writing that was thinking, "Wow, I didn't know I could do that." You know, and so. And it made me feel like, okay, then I'm capable of more than I thought. My imagination is is bigger and and um, I can be more uh, adventuresome about what I wanna tackle. And then I turned to this, which is a really a much kind of more, maybe more traditional story, but in a funny way, it was for me a new thing to drill so deeply inside of um, contemporary, fairly contemporary characters. All right, but I'm going to pressure you because I do think we as writers are only given like a handful of things around which we sort of spin over and over again in different ways, right? right. So what are the, what is the, um, the cohesive elements among your books? What are you fascinated by that you keep coming back to over and over again? Um, I think the thing that pops to mind, you know, I'm going to go with my first gut is, is the way in which we do and don't know one another. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of my collections was called Alone With You. And I think that that is maybe the kind of abiding fascination for me is the way in which um, we can't know each other mm -hmm. and how that plays out in, in all manner of situations. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly think about it, I, you know, I, both my parents passed away in the last 10 years at different times. And it's incredible when that happens and you realize how little you knew. Mm. You know, and, 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 and I think that in a funny way, so I, I guess I'm just endlessly fascinated by the way in which we try to know one another, we think we know one another, and then the way in which we are all complete mysteries to one another. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. <laughs> <You're right. Yeah. laughs> I'll keep writing about that because it'll never be answered. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think we can we can um, send them out of our souls. I think it just the groups exist there, and even if you think you're writing about something else, you end up writing about the same thing. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> so I'm going to open up the Q and A. Um, if you have more questions, please um, type them in as we're talking. So. Amy Willens asks, okay, how much do you think having had an earlier, oh, wait, wait, she already asked. Okay, I think I think you already answered this question, how um, your earlier career in the movies has affected the, the propulsive nature of your writing. So great, um, you have answered that. All right, Sarah Stone, my lovely Sarah Stone. Um, says this book is so extraordinary and heart cracking and such a huge pleasure to read because everyone feels so true and alive and the voice is so amazing. Were there one or more of the characters that you found hard to get to know? Oh, what a great question. Um, thank you, first of all, for saying those heartening things, Sarah. And um, I, I the hardest character for me to write was Miggy's mother. Mm. And I think she was hard because um, she's a, a very ambivalent character. And it's hard to write characters who are ambivalent mm -hmm. because they're always, or at least for me, because they're never 
they can never take a position. They can never take an action that describes who they are because they're, they're not that action. I don't know if I'm expressing it well enough, but she's terrifically ambivalent about where she is in her life. She's ambivalent about her marriage. She's ambivalent about her daughter who she finds, who she loves, but she finds unbelievably vexing and who brings out a sense of incredible inferiority on her part. I think she's a little scared of her daughter. And, um, and so it was very hard for me to figure out how to write her. And I just, and I finally thought, I finally came to understand that I had to write the ambivalence. I think I kept kind of trying not to have her be ambivalent. I kept thinking to myself, but what does she want? What does she want? What does she want? Which is like the classic question you ask about a character. What do they want? What are their desires? What motivates them? That's how you know what they're going to do. And then I realized I have to write a person who I don't know what she wants and she doesn't know. And it was hard, but in, you know, that was, that was, I mean, I hope I got, I got at it. I hope I scratched the surface of her. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really agree with Sarah. Um, Amy has another question. She says, getting into the mind of the protagonist who turns into a wolf, which you did so brilliantly in Little Nothing at one point, and getting into Miggy's mind, was it a different experience for you as a writer, speaking of a character not having vo the vocabulary for explaining herself? Um, I think that... Um, I, I don't know. I don't know that it's that different. I mean, what I think with all the characters that I write, it's just a, it's just about time, and about um, spending time with them, and 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 not accepting my first idea of who they are, but then having them do things and go through scene work and have a relationship to a person and have dialogue that that then tells me who they also are. And so so it's also always about kind of you know taking something that's two-dimensional initially that's how we start with with characters right um and then find dimensionalizing them you know more and more and more and more and that just takes an enormous amount of time it's like you know as i've said I, you know a little, i don't know if i've said this before but it's it's kind of like getting to know any human mm -hmm. you know it's like you know them initially very superficially and you think you know who they are, you would describe them to someone, oh, she's so funny and nice, right? But the next time you see her, she's doing something that's not funny and nice. And suddenly you say, oh, okay, so who is she? And so you keep saying, who is she? Who is she? Who is she? And I guess that's my experience with writing characters, whether they are, you know, people who turn into wolves and turn into other, which is in, in uh, little nothing or any characters. It's just, I'm keeping, I keep asking myself, yeah, but who is she okay. over and over again? Right. Yeah. And you keep testing the boundaries to see if they change. Yeah. 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 Um, Robin asks, uh, hello, she loves your work, uh, particularly Mary Coyne. She would love to hear more about your writing and revision process. Um, do you struggle with structure? As someone who, like Robin, who is working on her own first novel, she was somewhat relieved to hear Marissa says that say that you struggle with plots. It's hard for character centric books. I struggled the whole way through, Robin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I start a new book and, and I think, okay, I've done this a bunch of times. Yeah. I shouldn't know what I'm doing, but I don't because every new book is its own set of challenges. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't struggle with structure, in, but I know how to ask myself questions about structure so that I can try different things. And so um, I get, I don't, I mean, plot is just a struggle. It's sort of like math to me, like I'll never get it. But, um, but, but there are other questions like, you know, how do we get inside of a character? How do we structure? Um, I think I have enough um, in my toolkit to be able to say to myself, okay, this isn't working. So what else can I try? What happens if I take this and I put it in flashback? What happens if I take this and I move it way down the line? And so I, I feel like it's kind of, that's a fun part to me. That's like a, that's like playing. Um, revision is playtime. Putting the words on the page is the hard part for me, but revision is just like play. It's like, but what happens if you do this? And what happens if you do that? And then, and, and taking some big swings and saying, okay, but what, I mean, I wrote a whole book in the uh, third person. And then I, and then the revision, I said, well, oh, let's, what happens if we put it in the first person? And it's not that those things necessarily stick, but they tend to open up new avenues of thinking about 
the book or how it should flow or what the structure should be. So um, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, taking big giant swings and revision and, and, you know, once you, once I have it down, then I feel like, well, it's not going to go anywhere. So no matter what I do, it's going to be there for me to go back to if it doesn't work. Um, so that, that's my, my, uh, my general plan. <laughs> that's great. Throw it at the page and then. Yeah. <laughs> great. Um, Kristen Page Madonia says, Marissa, you spoke about some of your characters arriving fairly fully formed in your imagination. You said the name of the setting slash moment in history. Could you speak about revision and how you stay aligned with your original vision while also making room for shifts at the macro and micro level when you revise and rewrite? I think this is slightly different from what you were just saying. It is slightly different. Um, and I had the answer literally a second ago and now it slipped out of my head. Um, Tell me, can you read it one more time? Or well, if, it disappeared. It it's disappeared. So oh. <laughs> can you read? What, how is it different to you? <laughs> what did you ask? Um, you have an original vision. Uh, oh, okay, that's what I want to talk okay. about. Okay, um, I think when I write, uh, my goal is to have a way in, but not necessarily have a vision. Mm -hmm. So my goal is very much to allow surprise to happen. Um, and part of that is by not having too big a idea about how things are gonna go. Um, I mean, this this probably is part and parcel of my plot, um, you know, kind of frailty. But I think that if I don't, if I know where it's going, then I'm gonna drive the car right to the goal and it's gonna be kind of a boring trip. I'm gonna take the freeway, right? Cause it's fastest. But if I don't know where I'm going and I allow myself to get lost and I allow myself to like, you know, hit walls and come back and then I allow for surprise for me where I can discover things I didn't know this book was. And therefore I feel like the, the reader will be surprised even though they're reading a finished version. I think they will have a sense of that sense of discovery that I experienced. Mm -hmm. So in a funny way, my goal is to kind of trick myself into not imagining the whole thing mm -hmm. um, and not thinking I know what it's especially about, like aboutness. Like I never start out a book saying I'm writing about, you know, man's inhumanity to man, right? <laughs> it, it, let the book tell you what it's about. Let the, just focus down on the narrow story. Just let the story tell us what it's about in a, in a larger sense. I don't want to say this is, this is, these are my themes. This is what I'm trying to convey. The story will convey what it will. And then the story conveys what it will to any given reader. You know, the, the, the process of a book is in some ways not complete until it's read and the, it's read differently every single time. And so what the book is in your hands or your hands or anyone's hands is that is the book. That is the complete experience of the book. And it's going to be different. Different through time too, depending yeah. on how, where they, the reader is in their lives. Yeah. Exactly. So Rebecca asks, um, do you have children? In you didn't, so you can answer this if you want to. Um, do you have children of your own? Are there children in your family who may have influenced pieces of Miggy? You don't I have, do have children of my own. I have two boys who are, they're not children now. Um, they did not influence Miggy. Miggy is kind of sui generis, like in my mind, she just, she just is herself. And I, and I think in some ways it was a, a good thing that she wasn't suggested by someone I knew or an historical character or someone I'd read about in the news because it allowed her to be many, many things and not to have to be um, hemmed in by a real person. You know, when I wrote the book, Mary Coyne, which was about these real characters in history, it wasn't until I, you know, and I was looking at this picture of migrant mother, the famous migrant mother photograph. And I had read about the woman who took the photograph, Dorothy Lang. And I read about the woman whose picture it was, this woman named Florence Thompson. And, but it wasn't until I put the picture away and I had, and I renamed the characters that I could kind of create them fully. I was so hamstrung by these two women and what their lives were. And I didn't want to write that kind of historical novel. I wanted to write almost like I wanted to sample their lives, but invent on top of it. So for me, not having Miggy be suggested by someone I knew or my children or some other kid that I knew, I think just allowed me to create her very richly and freely and imaginatively. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Janet Clare, hi, says, so if there is power in childhood friendships and also in adult friendships, and I agree, she agrees that there is, then would it follow that there is power in love, romantic or not? Sure. You, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think a kind of power struggle is the basis for so much in fiction? That's a fantastic question. I say um, yes, because I think that that's the I basis think, of all dialogue. I think dialogue. the answer is resoundingly yes. yes. Um, I think it's why we write. I mean, I don't think that we would, well, I'm not going to make another general statement that people are going to shoot holes in, but I, I would not write about a, a tapioca relationship, you know, something that seemed very unfrettered, uh, frictiony. That wouldn't, like, why would I write about that? Like, what I'm interested in is why, why is there friction? What happens between people that makes it crackly and juicy. So yes, I think that power is very much at the center of relationships, which doesn't <laughs> mean that they're, you know, that they're somehow pragmatic or, I mean, there's power in love. I mean, yes, absolutely. You know, once we surrender to someone in that way, my God, we've given a lot of power to somebody. Mm, it's true. Yeah. Um, your description just made me very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Tapioca, <laughs> juicy, and dinner time. All right. Um, why did you choose the present tense for this narrative? Have you done this before? She didn't recall it in other novels. That's Amy. That's her. You know, I chose a present tense after trying um, many other tenses. Well, I mean, how many are there? But I, I, um, it was never the future tense. I, I wrote it a lot in the past tense for a while, and I felt that what the past tense did was it kind of distanced me from the immediate experience of these characters, especially Miggy, that even, even a past tense, it's kind of a, you know, what we're used to reading in past tense in fiction, which is a sort of artificial now, even though it's in the past tense, it somehow just made me feel like I, I was watching her instead of being with her. And certainly a kind of reflexive past tense, like, uh, you know, the, an older Miggy remembering this thing that happened towards a child felt, way too kind of, you know, distance and elegiac and, and it already put this kind of patina of memory on it that didn't work for me at all. So present tense, just when I tried it, I thought, yeah, that's it. Because it, it was like in the moment, um, not only were these um, sh emotional shifts for all the characters happening in the moment, but for Miggy, it captured her side sort of um, un, un uh, what's the word, uh, you know, her, her experience, which is not at all, uh, unadulterated, unadulterated. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thesaurus friend. <laughs> to yeah. It's just, it's just what's happening to her now. She's like right on her skin. I want it to be right on her skin. Okay. Yes. Um, Constance Matheson says, hi. So hi. good to see you. Um, how did writing the mysteries compare to writing your previous books? She can't wait to read it. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, it's so, this was one of the hardest books I've ever written and I don't know why. And it, it, it seemed like it should be so easy. It's kind of a basic idea. It's not some, I'm not creating an entire world like I did in Little Nothing and I'm not having people turn into other animals and other beings. And, um, and for some reason, and I think maybe because how simple it was, was why it was so hard because, because there were so many ways to go wrong in terms of um you know you want to you don't want to be uh melodramatic and you don't I, I mean there were just a lot of sort of pitfalls but it was also hard as i i think because of what i said earlier which was that i just realized that i i there were so many times where i thought i you know i i'm i'm still skating over the surface of these people even you know year two i'm still skating over the surface of these people and it's exhausting to have to keep figuring out who they are over and over again so that it was that was hard mm. Um, Jennifer Rubin says, thanks for a great conversation. Betsy Zeidman said, what a fun, thought-provoking thought conversation. It made her want to go reread the book, which she loved, and with her favorite bookstore. Hi, Marissa. And then the very last question, and um, we're, we're, then we're going to end, and Ice is going to come back on. Patricia um, Jasnowski says, you've made a couple comments about testing or stretching your imagination. Any tips on how you do that? Is it, like you said, on revision that you ask what if and take big swings? That is exactly what I was going to say. I, I not only ask what if, but I also say, why not? Okay. 
Why not? So Lauren, thank you so much. I want to thank you for doing this. And oh, I love seeing your beautiful face. I love seeing you too. And you're brilliant. And, and, you know, I hope you guys, of course, buy the book, but I hope you buy Lauren's brilliant books as well. <laughs> Today is for you. Do not buy Marissa's book or yes. <laughs> Well, um, I'd, I would honestly hate to break up this love fest. I could hear you guys like just listen to you talk for more hours, but unfortunately we are out of time. So I will be asking the final question for tonight. So Lauren and Marissa, tell us um, what you guys are currently reading, what you'd like to suggest or um, what you're working or sorry, we all know what you're working on, what you are current, like what's in your bedside table. <laughs> oh, well, my bedside table, you know, I've, I'm kind of in a rereading mode. I've been in a kind of go through my bookshelves and reread. So I just reread um, A Gesture Life by Chang Ray Lee um, in anticipation of reading his new book. And A Gesture Life is, um, you know, gorgeous and brilliant and sort of devastating. And I highly recommend it. What are you reading, Lauren? Um, I'm reading, I'm always in the middle of about 10 different books, but um, with a bunch of friends, I, I'm slowly making my, my, making my way through Life and Fate by Vasily Grossman, uh, which is a, just a constellation of war in a way that I've never read before. It's very difficult. I would not have been able to attack it in, until this year, I think, but um, I love it. It's, it's strange, wonderful, essayistic, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And thank you, Lauren and Marissa, for gracing us with your presence this evening. Thank you to the audience for spending some time with us. Your patronage is what enables us to bring you exciting, heartwarming events like this. And we cannot continue to host these types of events without the book sales to support them. So please support our wonderful guests and PNP by using the link in the chat to purchase the mysteries and as well as our guests other work <laughs> <laughs> i want to do that too um, yeah check <laughs> this has been so much fun check our website for the most current updated event listings as we have a great list to choose from and we do hope to see everyone there thank you thank you for joining us this evening and thank you marissa and lauren for your time your wit your warmth your insight it has been an amazing evening and for everyone don't forget to keep an eye out for lauren's novel coming out in september until then you have the mysteries by marissa to keep you company so everyone stay strong stay safe thank you and stay well read we'll see you all next time bye bye, bye.